Hello and welcome to Cape Ann Art Waves. Cape Ann Art Waves is a member program of 1623 Studios here in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Art Waves delves into the working life of our local arts community, those who both live and work here in the arts. My name is Jacqueline Ganim DeFelco, and I co host and co produce this show alongside my artist colleague, Christine Fisher. We're excited to announce that Art Waves has received over 10,500 views on YouTube since we began. And today we're introducing our 51st Artist of the Year. Cape Ann Art Waves is very grateful to our sponsors, Prince Insurance Agency, M. Christine Fisher, visual artist, the McDermott McCarthy team at Gibson Sotheby's International Realty and the Common Crow. And we'd also like to acknowledge our partners, Sea Arts and 1623 Studios. Without the collective effort of our sponsors and all involved, the show would not go on. And as we look to 2022, of course, we are talking to potential sponsors for 2022. So please think about helping us to take the show to 2022. We'd also like to recognize today, Steve, uh, Steve Lacey and Pat Verga who have provided music. Now I'd like to introduce today's artist, Leon Doucette. Leon, say hello to everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Here we Glad go. to be here. <laughs> so Leon is a, is a really a lovely and special person who I've enjoyed getting to know through his work actually at the Cape Ann Museum, but this is my first opportunity to really speak with Leon as an artist. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about Leon and his background. So he's a painter and curator, and he was born in 1989 here in Gloucester, Mass. So I consider him among our younger artists here in the community. He earned his BFA from the New Hampshire Institute of Art in Manchester, New Hampshire, which has recently been absorbed into um, another uh, school. So um, it's changed, it had changed a name along the way. He graduated with highest honors. His artwork since then has received both international and regional awards. Um, it's been prim primarily shown around New England, as well as New York, California, and Washington, DC. His recent awards include the gold medal at the Guild of Boston Artists 2018 Regional Juried Exhibition and first place drawing at the Portrait Society of America's 20th Annual International Portrait Competition. His work has also been selected as a finalist for the 13th International Art Renewal Center Salon Competition. Since 2011, Leon has also served on the curatorial staff of the Cape Ann Museum in Gloucester. And I can't just say also, because this is really primarily where Leon is spending his time. Um, and I remember when he started 10 years ago. Um, he has uh, also worked on a number of fabulous exhibits there at the museum, uh, including Marston Hartley's Soliloquy in Dogtown, John Sloan's Gloucester Days, um, and Drawn from Nature and on Stone, and the lithographs of Fitzhenry Lane in 2017. And it's not insignificant that Leon um, has worked um, and grown through his work at the museum in his own art, and we're going to learn more about that. Owing to his experience as a curator and constant dialogue with the artists of the past, Leon works in a traditional style, employing various academic techniques to create timeless, subtle images. He's interested in the physicality of subjects and works primarily with the figure and still life. And I think you're gonna be just overwhelmed by some of the beautiful work that we're gonna to show today. So, so Leon, welcome to the show and um, I think you've been extremely humble, honestly, about <laughs> <laughs> your work as an artist and all the discussions that I've had with you. Um, and I have just been blown away by what I've seen on your website and what you've shown me prior to doing the interview today. So congratulations on continuing your creative journey that you started um, obviously long before college. So let's talk about that. Tell me, sure. tell me about what happened sort of before um, the you decided to study art in college. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. And, and let me just say thanks. Thanks once again for the, uh, I'm, I'm humbled by that intro and, and also to be here. I'm so, so excited to, to talk with you and, and uh, with all the viewers as well. So yeah, um, uh, as you mentioned, I, I was born in Gloucester. I grew up sort of in the Lanesville area and uh, went to Gloucester High. And um, the, 
house that I'd grown up in was sort of like the walls of the house were plastered with my grandfather's paintings. He had passed away a few years before I was born, but he was a, a student of Emil Gruppi in like around like 1961, 1962. He got into painting and painted for the last like 20 years of his life. And uh, we had hundreds of paintings, it felt like, uh, in the house growing up, like a lot of them classic New England scenes, like sort of groupie esque um, you know, wharves and clam diggers and that sort of stuff. And uh, I don't know, I think there was a, it was a mix between being really drawn to, if you forgive the pun, um, <laughs> drawn to, to, to drawing when I was really little. And then as I, you know, I was old enough, as I got old enough to become aware of what was going on around me, I think seeing his artwork and felt feeling like I was transported back in time and that I really got to know this grandfather who I'd never met, mm. just a really powerful impression on me. And I think the connection to Groupie and other Cape Ann artists, and I used to come to the Cape Ann Museum in elementary school and in middle school and in high school and used to look at the Fitz Henry Lane paintings and stuff. Uh, I just, it felt like a foregone conclusion really early on, like in third or fourth grade, I would have teachers who would be like, you should be an artist when you grow up. And, uh, and that's what I wanted to do. So I, I kind of kept it going. Oh, that's great. And I think you wanted to share with us um, one of the pieces that you did. I'd love to see how people started out. So why don't you talk yeah. about the very first piece? Sure. So, uh, so this first, uh, this piece here is a, um, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing particular, but it was something, I don't know, I probably did when I was a sophomore, junior in high school. Uh, and I was really interested in, in pen and ink at that time. I, I think I was, you know, it was at a period where I'm looking at my grandfather's seascapes and I'm looking at Fitz and Lane paintings and I'm like, geez, I don't know how to, I don't really, no one was teaching me how to paint and draw what I could see. So I was often working from imagination a lot and was, and was looking at uh, etchings and book illustrations and things. And I was kind of just working with pen and working with black and white because it sort of felt, I don't know, like it was something that I could control a little bit more. And, and I think that even though I have, um, you know, this, this figure is a little, a little spooky, a little, maybe, maybe nice for Halloween. Um, I think that my interest in form and in uh, a, a black and white puzzle piece shapes kind of fitting together is already sort of evident, even at this early stage, um, thinking about texture. And, and I think it's, in some ways, the sort of blank background of this piece is is something that uh, that I've continued to to sort of you know I'm, I I sometimes wonder if I should do a little bit more with the backgrounds of my work, but I'm so interested in the focal point, whatever right. the subject is, whether it's a collection of objects or a portrait or something. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I I thought I I would uh, I would share a piece from high school to see where I jumped off from. Yeah, exactly. And you did mention, obviously, a lot of people who influenced you in terms of art, the greats of, of Cape Ann. Um, but I'm very curious, specifically in college, was there something in college that do you think was sort of a turning point for you or that you went there to? Yeah. Learn? Yeah. So my first, so my first year at school, I was actually in the illustration department and it was because I had a portfolio that was full of this, this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I, I think that first year, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do with my, you know, on my art journey. Uh, I was, I was very aware of wanting to, to gain the tools to sort of paint and draw from life. Uh, but I wasn't, I didn't quite have a, you know, I hadn't found my voice yet. I wasn't even sure what I was gravitating toward. I liked everything. And it took, uh, I, I had a teacher named Jonathan Simon, who was a, he was sort of, he was teaching illustration and painting classes at the time. And he was a student of this other artist, Jacob Collins, who is still alive and working today, who does, who sort of uh, does these beautiful classical realist paintings. And John Simon, my professor, sort of introduced some 19th century French atelier style approaches to our painting class. And they were things that were very, you know, strictly drawing and painting from life and, and trying to, you know, visually dissect what you're seeing and thinking about the angle of the light source and all this stuff that I, you know, real mechanical stuff that I was waiting for, but had never been exposed to. Um, and John took us in 2010, I remember, to a exhibition called A Figurative Presence. 
at uh, St. Anselm College up in New Hampshire. And I, it, it had one of his mentors paintings, Jacob Collins, this sort of reclining nude figure. It had a painting by uh, this guy, Graydon Parrish, sculptor uh, David Simon. And I just remember being blown away because it looked like stuff that I would see at the Cape Ann Museum or at the MFA. And these are, these are like men and women that are working today. And it, it blew me away. And I think I felt this gravitational shift at that point in my, you know, what I wanted to do with my artwork. And uh, the first painting that I had sort of done that had uh, incorporated some of those principles and some of those processes is actually uh, this other painting that I uh, have here that is a, um, a painting of my father sitting at a table with a decanter of whiskey mm. um, that I, I painted. I think I painted this in 2010. I was probably mm. 19. And even though this painting and the, um, the pen and ink drawing that, that, that we were just looking at are only maybe three years apart, if that. Uh, a big evolution for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and, and so I sort of think of that pen drawing as sort of the, the, the end of the childhood doodling I was doing oh. um, through most of my childhood, just, you know, in a sketchbook. And this, mm -hmm. this painting of my father being sort of the first of my like real painting voice that I've sort of been carrying this trajectory from ever since. And I think your father um, obviously had a lot of influence on you and we're, he's going to keep popping up here yeah. <laughs> during this interview. So we're yeah. going to give him a lot of credit. Uh, yeah. Starting with the grandfather's I'm, DNA. Now we have your dad. No, that's actually, that was my mom's, my, my mom's father. Was oh, the, uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And my mom's been a, I, I shouldn't, shouldn't count her out. She's been a, an amazing influence as well. I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't give her a shout out. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about the styles you've chosen to go down. You've chosen to go down two directions, um, still lifes and portraits. Um, and I'd like to now bring up a couple of those. Let's start with the still lifes um, and have you just uh, talk about this one in particular. It has um, a little, I think that's a skeleton. Um, oh, it, yeah, it's a, uh, I think it's a coyote skull. Oh, a coyote um, skull. Yeah, okay, there you yeah, go. So where yeah, did you come from? Did you actually have a coyote <laughs> skull sitting around? <laughs> I, I do. I can actually, it's on my mantle. I can actually see wow, it right now. It's, okay. been a, it's been a, it's been a nice, uh, it's a little macabre, but it's been a nice uh, still life piece. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's sort of um, that little memento mori thing. I don't know, a reminder of your mortality or something, but no, I, I think um, still life and portraiture, I mean, fundamentally for me, are really about, I, I feel like I often use the word sculptural, like uh, the, the, they are physical masses that are made up of planes and have volume. And I mean, my work is so much about having, you know, painting light as it sort of comes across those forms. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've been drawn to these uh, to these sorts of subjects more so than than landscape. And um, I know we'll, we'll talk about landscape a little bit later, but um, it, landscape was never something that I was naturally drawn to. I think uh, because it's and maybe there's too much information or something. The light is changing, and 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 you have to and there's these big wide vistas. And so for a for a still life like this, um, painting is really meditative to me. Uh, it's it's sort of a, you get into that flow state you hear people talk about, you know, if things are going well and, uh, you know, deep concentration, deep looking. I mean, I, I have, I guess I have to remind myself every now and again, that it's not, I don't know, maybe it's not typical for, for most people to like stare at an apple for like 13 hours, you know, as they're just sitting in the quiet in the room. And for me, it's, it's like breathing. It's, it's been a, it's just like a, a regular part of my life. And, um, and this piece, Silent Vessel, I remember doing uh, a couple of years ago uh, by window light, just in the mornings, you can sort of see the reflection of my window there uh, in the, in the, uh, the vase. And I don't know, it's just sort of a, just a love letter to morning light coming in kind of across this blue fabric and, and the way that the texture of that bone, one of the reasons that I, that I really love painting that skull as well is that it has this great subsurface scattering effect where when light hits it, it sort of penetrates through it a little bit and the rim of the shadows have these really warm 
details that uh, that come across it. You can sort of see in, in a little bit of the brow ridge on the on the left side of the brow ridge there. So, well, that's quite that's quite a piece. And then the other genre, of course, is your portraiture, which is quite exquisite and obviously requires the, the same type of focus. So let's let's um, switch it up to um, the study and the actual end piece that you yeah. did of Melissa. Yeah, so this is uh, this is Melissa Cooper. Uh, she is my she's been my partner for many years, and uh, she is a fabulous artist as well. Um, and if I, I encourage people to to check out her work as well. Um, so this uh, little drawing here was a a study that I had done of her face. And you know, if you thinking about what we were just talked about in that still life, I mean, a lot of the same principles apply. I mean, just light coming across forms the sort of the landscape of the face, which is a term that I remember one of my teachers using once upon a time. Uh, thinking about light and shadow and, and playing with focal points. And again, like, like trying to find interlocking dark and light shapes that feel, that make like a pleasing pattern. Yeah. And, and this, uh, this study really uh, focused on the face. And then you can see here, um, if we look at the, at the finished painting, uh, quite a bit is different. I mean, she's wearing different outfits. She has her hair down rather than up. Um, but the, but the face and the way that the lighting kind of played across the face was, was a very important, uh, part of the emotional impact of this painting. And I think that, um, I should say too, that portraits for me, like there is a, uh, like a resonance from one human being as a viewer, when you're looking at a, at a handmade image of another human being, uh, I don't know, that just, that, that hits something on the subconscious and, um, I, I understand that there's a little bit of a difficulty for some people appreciating a painting of a person that they don't know or a painting of a person, you know, who's unidentified, but that's never been me. I, I just, I love paintings of people of, you know, uh, no matter who they are, it just, it's, it's like a dialogue between the artist and the person depicted. And uh, I've just, it's always really excited me. It's also a very traditional way of approaching art, right? I mean, we all yeah. have great portrait artists that we've come across in our life. So on that note though, this was a painting, we specifically wanted to use this as a discussion about your process, like mm -hmm. the starting point. And then, you know, do you sort of draw, do you walk away from things for a while? Like just, just sort of highlight the, the way that you generally go about this process. Yeah. So. Um... So this painting uh, was one of the first times that I employed a process that I'd uh, that I'd heard a lot about in history books uh, or art history books. Um, a process referred to sometimes as the Flemish technique. Uh, it's but it was used a lot in France and other places. And uh, essentially, it is a process of building up your values, which is to say your sort of like a grayscale, black and white from, from white to black, building up those, um, those tones fully realized uh, simply in black and white, mm -hmm. and then subsequently going over them with successive layers of glazes. Again, it was something that I had, that I had read about, you know, master painters using hundreds of years ago. Uh, and in the back of my head, even when I was in, even when I was in college, I was thinking like, oh, that'd be fun to experiment with. But I never, it seems like every time I sat down to do a painting for a long time, I would just, you know, I'd try to get as close as I could to the flesh tone of the forehead. And um, yeah. so I finally tried to, uh, tried it out with this painting. And, and uh, it's, I, we have a couple examples of another Grisaille. I mean, it's a process that I use, use a lot now. Um, yes, I'd like to show the other one that you specifically talked about, um, and I believe this takes us back to your father again. Is that correct? Yeah. So yes. Yeah, so he's uh, he's just he has a very I don't know very graphic face. I'm not sure. My, my dad just has this. He's got this white beard and these and these angly cheekbones, and it's just just fun to fun to draw. Just you know shapes. Um, but uh, in this uh, this is a, a side by side image here, uh, and on the left. Um, we can see that fully realized, uh, the term for it is a grisaille, coming from the French, French word for gray, uh, uh, G-R-I-S. And um, the idea is that the, in this technique, I'm thinking about the, the light facing planes. So thinking about his face and the angle of the light source 
areas that are being influenced by the primary light source, like particularly mm -hmm. his nose and his brows and, and sort of the, the ridge of his, of his zygomatic arch here, his cheekbones, picking up a lot of that light. And so painting those areas more thickly, more opaquely, and then waiting for that really armature to fully dry. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the right, you can see the effect of, of going back in and in, in multiple layers of glazing in sort of the, the mm -hmm. yellows and the ochres and the crimsons and stuff of the skin and sort of making it feel like there's some some blood and flesh in there. Uh, and it's just a really, I don't know, it's a really gratifying process. It's very meditative. I like the stratified workflow. Um, mm -hmm. I certainly don't do it uh, for, for every painting. I, I, I've experimented with doing it a little bit with still life, but it's a, but it's a process that I'm, I'm happy to have in my toolkit now. Mm -hmm. We didn't bring any of this um, you know, forward in terms of photographs, uh, but I'm curious because I feel like on Instagram, I had seen something you were doing plein air. Is that true? Yeah. Yep. You're also experimenting with that? A little yeah, bit. yeah, yep, exactly. Okay. So I think, yeah, and that's sort of the opposite. It's very, it's that's more a direct painting where you're, right. you're showing up and you may only be there for for a couple hours. So you try to capture, yeah, uh, capture what it is you you have uh, in front yeah. of you. Because there's somebody yeah. who's so studied and so um, academic in terms of going back and adding, that has to be a real challenge for you to be just totally spontaneous like that. Yeah, yeah, and I think. Um, so we, I, I have another, another piece here. It's actually the one that's behind me on the wall here. Oh, yes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, it, this was a foggy day uh, down at Dane Street Beach in Beverly. Mm. And um, there was a, I was coming home from the hardware store somewhere uh, in the, there was a fog bank that was rolling in and, and I knew I only had, I don't know, a, a couple hours to capture it, um, if that. So uh, Melissa and I, uh, took our we ran home grabbed our plein air stuff went back down to the beach and uh that that lonely figure down on the beach is is her she's a tiny little i don't know depending on how tight we get in here um mm -hmm. that's her in the in the right uh upper right portion of the of the painting okay and uh yeah it's it it, it, it has been challenging i think to um to not only work uh directly and intensely and quickly like that but i think to overcome some of the some of the hurdles that for a long time i i considered myself a studio painter and not a plein air painter mm -hmm. and i've 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 only recently in the last year started thinking about how damaging it can be to your own sort of you know artistic journey to to mm. box yourself in that kind of way yeah you know because even though the light was changing and that's distracting and, and you have to simplify the trees and that that feels like that's distracting for me the single biggest distraction for a long time when trying to play an air paint was this like nagging feeling that like oh this isn't really me I shouldn't be out here I should really be in the studio that's more my thing mm -hmm. and that like where does that come from that was just some arbitrary yeah. thing that I guess I decided subconsciously years ago. Yeah. Well, you're growing, you're growing as an yeah. artist, right? <laughs> Those are growing pains, yep. <laughs> simply yep. growing pains. That's all. Yeah. So I want to segue here into what you described to me as, is a true transition, uh, an emotional time in your life where probably one of your best pieces evolved as a result of that. Again, bringing this back to your dad. Who seems yeah. Quite the guy. Yeah. So uh, he, yeah, he is, he is, he is great. Um, so yeah, I, I, I hope you won't mind me, me mentioning that a, a few years ago uh, he had had a stroke and um, it was, you know, I, I count myself very lucky that I've had a, I've had a, a very close knit family and we've had, we've had a lot of good luck with health and we're, um, I have two older brothers, uh, and they have they have children, and and we've always been tight knit, and we've been very lucky when it comes comes to to family trauma, and so this was kind of a new experience uh, that my dad was going through this you know this challenging time where we weren't sure if we were going to lose him and and uh, or what, and uh, right at that time I remember just like trying to lose myself in this one piece that I was that I had started here this drawing uh, called Gathering. Um, which uses Melissa as a model. I think a through line as a quick aside that anyone looking at my work may notice, and maybe this is just my personality or whatever, but I, uh, most of my models tend to be my friends and family and people that I care about. 
Um, I do, I do paint commissions and I love doing them, but my, in my personal work, I usually just use the people that I love and Melissa I've painted a ton of times. And in this case, I guess maybe she's a stand in for my dad or she's a stand in for me or, or some sense of gathering strength or, 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 or gathering your sort of, mm. uh, you know, stealing yourself. And, uh, it was an emotional piece to work on. And, uh, for me was, was very cathartic. And uh, the, the story kind of has a happy ending because my dad uh, ended up pulling through and, and he's doing great. And uh, this painting uh, later that year ended up, I submitted it to uh, the international, uh, it was one of, the, one of the awards that you had mentioned at the beginning of this, this mm -hmm. interview, um, uh, the Portrait Society of America's uh, uh, International Portrait Competition. Mm -hmm. And they had received, I forget, it was like 1300 entries or something from, from across the world. And uh, this, this piece ended up winning first place drawing. And uh, so I got to go down to DC. It hung in a show down there uh, with, with uh, some of the other people that were invited to the show. And I got to meet a lot of artists who I really admired. Mm -hmm. And uh, to get that sort of international recognition, uh, it was that's so for me it was sort of this turning point too in in the first sort of recognition that I'd gotten on a large scale like that and and was talking to these other artists whose work I admired who were telling me how much they're admiring this and we're talking about what's going on in the piece and uh, so it's something that's very near and dear to me I still have it hanging on my mantle and uh, and uh, maybe someday it'll wind up at the Cape Ann Museum we'll see that be special that would not be special so I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna ch transition to a different uh, way of thinking about things you know yep being so involved in the arts community, finding, uh, and I'll say young artists, you know, out of college and at the stage that you're at is, is, is very, it's a, it's a special thing here, right? Because a lot of young people haven't been able to come back to Gloucester for, you know, one reason or another or Cape Ann. Yeah. So, um, you know, to, for those who are out there trying to make their way, we, we try to bring out anything we can that will help bring that community closer together. So I'm kind of curious um, how you've interacted with other young artists, whether they're, especially because of the pandemic, I think there's probably more things online that have happened. Any Anything you want to throw out there to share with the community of your peers? Yeah, I, I think that um, the I, I think especially because of the pandemic, uh, artists have gotten really creative um, in where they find community and how they collaborate. And, um, and I, I would encourage anyone who feels like isolated or like they're working in a vacuum to just to sort of like look around and see what exists out there. Uh, for my own piece, I know that um, uh, even just within the last couple months, I had uh, stumbled across a, uh, a group online, sort of a, a, a little bit of a, of a message, message group uh, of, of artists that has, that has uh, hundreds of mostly young uh, portrait artists who are, uh, have built a little community by sharing photographs of themselves with the group um, for, 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 for other members of the group to use. With, with everyone having free access to this sort of image bank and then drawing, you know, connections, getting to know the other artist who you've just done a portrait of, mm -hmm. and they get to know you and, and sharing one another's work and cross pollinating ideas and stuff. Um, and, and I'm sure that there's, that there's a number of things out there like that. I mean, social media on its own is, is, is one way to sort of reach people. But I mean, if you start digging a little deeper, uh, you never know what you're going to find. And sure. I've done, yeah, and I've done one or two uh, of these of these paintings now, and gotten to know uh, a little bit, getting to know uh, some of the other artists that are involved in this project. Mm. So it's well, that's great. Yeah. And I I just think you know we need to share all that kind of information as much as we can, right? Especially mm -hmm. if you've had a good experience, which I know you have. Yeah. So let's talk about this fabulous institution that you work for, the Cape <laughs> Ann Museum. Um, so you you've had an incredible opportunity to grow as a curator with the, as the museum is on this, is this trajectory of growth um, and just making such an impact, you know, on the community and you've been right there with it. And so, and it's obviously a wonderful marriage for you, your love of history, your, your love of art and your, I mean, this is, this is like a kid in a candy store, right? <laughs> It really, yeah, I mean, it, it, it really is. So given that, I'm kind of curious, you know, when do you find your 
because that's a busy job and it's a fabulous yeah. job. And, and from everything you told me, you love it passionately. When do you, when are you able to kind of go inside yourself and focus on your artwork? Like how do you separate that out? And, and when do you, when do you do that? Yeah. I mean, uh, in, in some ways it's sort of as simple as like, like what roof I'm under at, at any given moment. If I'm under my roof, it's I'm, I'm working on artwork. And if I'm at the museums and working at the, uh, I'm, I'm in the other headspace, but no, it's, it's, uh, I think that if only it were really that simple. Uh, the museum really is a fantastic place. And I, I feel like it is, it to me represents, like it, it really symbolizes what Cape Ann art and history is all about. And I think so in, you know, going back to my own journey of like, like what I was doing with my grandfather's artwork when I was a little kid and being inspired by it, like that had such a profound impact on me, but not everybody has a house full of like their grandfather's bygone, you know, visions of a bygone era with, uh, you know, stone wharves and clam diggers and everything. So it, really trying to do my part to help facilitate that sense of inspiration for, for other artists, for other people. Um, I, I'm just, I mean, clearly I'm, I'm so interested in history and I, I think that there is definitely some cross-pollination that happens. Uh, I, I like to think that my passion for this place I mean it's more than a job for me I, I feel like they're sort of these these dual roles even though they're both kind of different like my wearing my painter hat versus wearing my curator hat are all sort of serving to to elevate this place and in, in our story kind of you know because yeah. as much as as much as I can do as a as an artist like mm -hmm. I, I am I come from here I, I feel very connected to this narrative and um yeah I mean that 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 comes to the fore when I, when I think of my relationship with the museum, for sure. Well, I think, um, I know that you're going to, um, keep growing in both of those roles. There's no doubt about it. So as you separate out your role as an artist, I'd like to find out, you know, kind of what are your maybe near term and slightly longer term goals, um, for your work? You know, is it just, the refinement of the work itself is it to sell and get some commissions or be in a particular show you know i'm just kind of curious how you're how you're thinking about that piece of it yeah yeah well so i think i mean i i would love to continue to refine my work um i mean ultimately i i want my work to continue to feel satisfying for me and and uh at, at in my current trajectory i i think that's i hope that that's the case i'm i'm as satisfied or more with, you know, explore. I'm just, I'm constantly exploring new questions. Um, and yeah, uh, I mean, I think that there's, there's inherently a challenge with balancing a 40 plus hour a week job um, at the museum with whatever time I have left over once you subtract out, you know, mm -hmm. groceries and social engagements <laughs> and everything else. Uh, and so what I do with that time, I, I hope to be, uh, I hope to be able to produce more and, you know, it would be great to be great, great to, um, to sell and, and to, uh, pick up more commissions, just knowing that it, it can help support more work. And, uh, and it also tells me that people are, people are moved enough to want, you know, part of my story to be, um, ha have a piece of my story in their lives. I think, it, you know, that's, yeah. that's very moving. Um, well, now this is your chance, right? Because you can tell us what's new, what's coming up that we should yeah. be looking out for, um, and also how we reach you, right? And yeah. how, how how we get in touch with you for our our portrait commission or uh, a show or anything else. Yeah. So please, uh, yeah, please do do be in touch. Um, uh, I I have a website, leonduset.com. Uh, there's a contact form through there. Uh, you can also reach me. Uh, I'm I'm fairly active on uh, Instagram at uh, Leon Doucette Fine Art at Leon Doucette Fine Art, mm -hmm. um, and so that has uh, that has some uh, more up to date uh, musings about what I'm working on and and in a lot of process shots and things like that. Feel free to send me a message through there, and uh, and I should say too that. Um, I, something that I, I hope by the time this interview airs, I will have live in my website. And if it's not, it will be, it will be live in short order is a, um, 
uh, some information about about commissioning a portrait. I I, I understand that it's it's tricky um, and challenging to uh, if if people don't really know what to expect in that in the process of commissioning a portrait or, or having a portrait commissioned is. Uh, to, to demystify some of that and, and have a little bit more clarity and transparency, I think uh, I'm, I'm going to have a section of my website dedicated to that. So uh, that will be yet another way you can be in touch. Yeah, that'll be great. I think that's really needed because this is, it's very daunting, I would say. Yeah. If you were thinking of having a portrait done for somebody you love or, you know, I mean, I don't know how many people want to do it of themselves. <laughs> But you yeah. know, whatever, whatever way you're looking at it, there's a lot of choices and there's a lot to understand about the process. Certainly. So that's yeah. great. And I think, yeah, and I think it makes it easier for, for people that are interested in it. And it and it also makes it easier uh for for the artists like me to to know that people have a baseline understanding going into it. So that's great. Um, if, any, if anyone's interested, keep an eye out. We're we're wrapping up today with Leon Dusat, wonderful. Uh, artist here in Cape Ann and a member of the Distinguished Cape Ann Museum team. So I want to thank our audience and you can find us um, on Cape Ann Artwaves playlist on 1623studios.org. Um, also, this is uh, appears on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Channel 12 uh, on your local Comcast uh, station here in Cape Ann. And until then, we want to remind everybody to acknowledge our fabulous sponsors when you see them. Um, and uh, thank you. Until next time, you'll see Christine Fisher a couple weeks down the road with the next episode of Cape Ann Artways. Thank you again. Thank you.